to be honest, I can speak like a whole day about it, so 15 minutes on that. Uh, it's in a nutshell. I hope I can present a bit of things that are helpful for you, but um, yeah, maybe you dive deeper into some of the things I like to introduce to you. Um, yeah, so um, I get started introducing myself. Um, this is my team. I come from Hamburg and this is at the University Hospital there. Um, we are a team of psycho-oncologists and also um, musician therapists and um, um, art, art uh, therapists. And also I'm in an ambulatory practice in Lübeck uh, next to the Baltic Sea. Got a bit washed away last night, but uh, yeah, you see the weather's always pretty good there. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm mostly specialized in uh, young people with cancer. Um, since last Sunday, I'm still I'm not young anymore because it's under 40 and I crushed that. But um, my current project is peer to me a mentoring um, where um, a young adults that already have um, um, are in a, um, young survivors being like about two years out of treatment will um, go with newly diagnosed people and uh, be close to them. And um, so I'm really happy to be here because I think that mentoring and being in a group and having other specialists and peers around you is really, really helpful. And also science has shown that. Um, yeah, the big topic of mental health, um, mental health, with, even without a chronic disease or a physical disease, is a state of mental well-being um, that enables people to cope with the stresses of life, with, uh, to realize their abilities, learn well and work well, and contribute to their community. Um, this is what the um, WHO says, and um, I want to focus a bit of, on that, how that is when, you're, um, when you have a disease and uh, how this is stressed by that. Um, we've heard a bit of it in the fatigue and stuff like that, and also with the um, pins and needles in the hand. Um, there are special mental distresses in, um, in cancer patients. Um, on the one hand, there's this change in body integrity. There's a change in how you felt before and how you're feeling at the moment. It can be pain, handicaps, and ailments. Um, there's also this emotional disbalance, new intensified feelings that you've never, and threats that you've never um, experienced before. It's changes in the self-concept, just like Vern said, his self-concept was being active and busy in all areas and now uh, autonomy, body image, uncertainty, everything changed a bit. And also the insecurity in social roles, the loss of roles when you um, have to drop out of a job or something like that and functions and you can't do as much as you used to. And also at some point um, having some uh, dependency on um, being at your relatives and also the healthcare system. Also, um, the change environment. Um, mostly you're not used to be in a healthcare system before that and um, having this new social role, experiencing this new environment where sometimes you're just a diagnosis and not just a woman or man or just you're just a number 2.53 or something like that. And this is just environments that we're not used to and this is also something we have to adapt to. And uh, last but not least, also a threat of life that's causing mental distress. Um, not even if it's not even an acute crisis, it can be uh, multiple loss experiences that you lose different parts of your life, one after the other. This is distress for, uh, for people. And so um, I'm telling you this so that you can already maybe reflect on it or just um, that you know um, what can cause mental distress, even though you're not feeling it all of, all of the points at the moment, maybe at some point, so that you can uh, already have it in mind, maybe to um, yeah, to find bodies or help in that, with that. Um, 
to show you um, that you're not alone and maybe you could plan a bit forward. The typical inpatient cancer patient reports about 10 of these distress symptoms and the typical outpatient cancer patient reports about five distress symptoms. This is a lot and there's a direct correlation between the number of distressing symptoms and the quality of life. Um, so if you're already thinking about of some of the distressing elements, you can maybe uh, reduce or plan the impact when you, uh, when you get in a state of one of these uh, distress symptoms. Um, but distress and can be normal, of course it is. Um, being a human being is stressful, but there's a difference between a normal distress and a severe distress. We have fears, we have worries, we have sadnesses, and this is all normal. But if it's severe and it's a depression, it's an anxiety disorder or family or spiritual crisis, then it can be helpful to seek for professional help there. Um, it's like, as you can see, it's not something that you can really um, cut off at some point. So just have in mind, if you feel that it's too overwhelming, you can, you can have a look at uh, seeking for help, for professional help. Um, how common is it to have mental distress and to have severe mental distress? Uh, nearly one quarter of cancer patient reports a mental disorder, a real, like a severe distress, being it um, an anxiety disorder or mood disorder. And with that, you can see that it's normal or it's kind of normal to experience a mental disorder accompanying the um, WM maybe at some point. So have that in mind that you already seek for who could be available if I um, if I feel so distressed that I want to want to see help. Um, there, um, in cancer, there are special mental distresses. Um, the fear of recurrence or progression is different to being afraid of flying or being afraid of heights. Because in contrast to these anxiety disorders, this is a fear of a real existing threat. And so that's, uh, it's a different therapy approach than in the classical phobias. In the classical phobias, you would send someone up the tower and just let him experience that nothing happens out there. And this is not happening in this case. So this is more like something that you find an individual stance, an individual um, way of coping with this uh, kind of threat that is in behind and that's coming more up and down, maybe in psychotherapy, maybe in self-care self groups, self-help groups, and also find a mindful and self-compassionate way. I will talk about that a bit later. Um, yeah, fear, fear is an um, emotion to protect us. It's a very old emotion and um, it's more targeted on threats from the outside, like it's an, yeah, and from the Stone Ages, it's more like about the tiger or, the, or fires. So it's not about something that's coming from the inside. Um, so the fear says, that, says to us, don't go there, you might die there. And so we don't, and so we stay alive. So that is kind of the basic, uh, the basic thing of fear. But with a chronic illness, this doesn't work. So... Um, you have to think about it a different way. And one way would be, um, this is like the cognitive behavioral therapy, is that you find, um, you find a way of thinking that emotions are an assessment of the situation, that thoughts are not reality in that point. So that thoughts are just thoughts, they are appraisals of a situation, they are what you look at it, what you fear at the moment, but they are not the reality at that moment so that you can just have it go through in some point and go like, okay, you're an emotion. I see you. I feel you. And I will look after myself and I will seek um, 
professional help with that. But um, this is just, at the moment, this is just the fear. This is just not the reality at this moment. Um, the fear is based on the assessment or the thought it would be dreadful if, and it can be helpful that you write it down, what would be dreadful. And then you can debate with yourself or with your partner or your, your um, physician what would be dreadful and how certain is it and how certain is it at this moment. And so maybe you can put the, the weight out of it. Um, we can manage our thoughts. Uh, it's easier to manage your thoughts than manage your emotions. So it's better to first manage your thoughts and get them on the table and look at them. And then with that, we can manage our emotions. And that's a thing that you can do in psychotherapy and you can learn that. Um, and also in self-help gr self groups, when you ask, what did you do? How did you cope with that? What did you think? Which thoughts were helpful for you? Um, I have this, um, this little intervention for you. And I'd love to uh, do that, you to do that with me. Um, when you really have strong emotions and you're in acute tension, being it in the waiting room just because uh, before you're getting results or something like that, where you feel like, okay, I can't stand it at this moment, my uh, tension is rising. Uh, I want you all in your head to name five things that you can see now. And now, name four things that you can hear. A bit more difficult. And now, if you already found four things that you can hear, name three things that you can touch with your skin, that you can feel with your skin, with your hands. Name two things you can smell. Mostly the room and sometimes yourself <laughs> or a bit of lunch leftovers. And now we come to the lunch leftovers. Name one thing that you can taste. This uh, is pretty easy if you do it in this. Um, but if you just swap them around and you have like four things that you can taste, then it gets even more, and then you have like the attention all in the now, and so you get a bit out of your thoughts. Um, also really nice, this comes from um, trauma therapy, this is the butterfly hug, and the butterfly hug, it works like uh, that you form a butterfly with your hands, and you, uh, you can put, put them here under the clavicula, and then you tap it always like one after the other, at alternating. And this is getting your nervous system a bit down. And also you have your hands ready wherever you are, so this should be nice. So this is from the EMDR therapy that's used in trauma. And you can just do it until you also breathing pretty good with that one. Um, um, last but not least, um, this self-compassion that I want to show you, um, I want to link it with the, with the fatigue we just heard. Um, self-compassion, um, we mostly, we are more compassionate with other people around us than with ourselves. We always want ourselves to perform really good and do whatever we always did. And, uh, we are, yeah, we're not so nice with ourselves than we are with others. Um, so um, Kristen Neff um, is f uh, uh, doing research in that self-compassion therapy. And I think especially when you're uh, experiencing weaknesses at some point, this is really nice thing to learn how to look at yourself in a compassionate way. Self-compassion means self-kindness. And also this a shared sense of common humanity means that we are all in one boat. We are all suffering in one point in our lives. 
And suffering is a, yeah, it's a kind of Buddhist thing, but suffering is something that we all experience in our lives. And being mindful with that. So when you're compassionate with someone else, you see like maybe like a child that just dropped an ice cone. You feel, you feel compassionate about it. You see the suffering. You want to help. You let that emotion into your heart and you want to soothe that one. And it's about like having this kind of emotion towards yourself. Um, and it's good for limitations when you, when you get to know my power is not as, as high as it used to be. I cannot compete in the social roles that I used to be, the activities, like also the things that weren't said, and also with negative emotions. Um, how would you treat a friend? Would you talk loud? to your friend like you talk to yourself in your mind. Um, so the thing is that maybe change your critical self-talk to be more loving and friendly with yourself. Also, if you're experiencing um, fear, you go like, yeah, I do understand that you are fearful now, that you are worried right now. And it's okay to feel worried right now. And not yet just get yourself together. Just be compassionate about yourself, because it's okay to have negative emotions. It's okay to feel weak at some times, and just look at yourself like you're your own best friend. Also, I, say, I see that I cannot perform as I used to, and I'm sad about it. Instead of being angry with myself, I need comfort and assure myself that it's okay to perform in a different way than before. I am still as loved as much because you would not love a friend less because he can't run a half marathon anymore. Okay. Um, I don't know if we have time for that. Um, now she's shaking her head. Um, I really love that meditation. It's called a tree meditation. Um, it's, um, I don't know if the slides will be passed around, so probably it's on there. Um, um, it's a meditation about how can I get what I need right now. And sometimes you can speak it as a voice message on your phone and just listen to it. It's about five to seven minutes. If you read it to yourself as a voice note and you listen to it when you're feeling really uh, yeah, weak or something like that, you can listen to it and feel nourished by that meditation. Yeah, greetings from Hamburg. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>